Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 25th of July 2012. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is once again Blacklight Retribution. It's too much fun hitting people in the head with crowbars. I'm sorry, this game is here to stay for a while. First email comes in here from Johnny that says, Hi TB, as a huge Total War fan, I was thrilled to hear that Total War Rome 2 has just been announced. Before this, I had had conversations with people that seemed convinced that the next game in said franchise would be set in the World War 1 period. This seemed supported by the features that were introduced in Total War Shogun 2, Fall of the Samurai, such as railroads and naval bombardment. I've always considered Total War games to be at their best at ancient and medieval times, and although I enjoyed the ship battles in Empire, I felt it was the weakest game in the series. In your opinion, did Creative Assembly do the right thing in returning to their roots, or should they have tried out something completely different? Well, I think it makes sense to make Rome 2 because of how beloved the original Rome was, and I'll be honest, I actually preferred Medieval 2, but I think from a pure balance, polish, and gameplay standpoint, Rome was probably the better game. I just find the medieval time period to be more interesting and more diverse, whereas the Roman time period, not so much. So as a result, I was very much into medieval. Now, your point about Empire is interesting because I think all of the more modern day games that have had firearms as the focus have been significantly weaker. I think only Fall of the Samurai gets away with it because it's got this interesting culture clash going on. Empire and Napoleon, while Napoleon was certainly better than Empire in many respects, just aren't as much fun because at the end of the day, it's just guys with muskets in a line. And yes, there's artillery, that's fun. And yes, there's naval combat, which is also fun. But I honestly don't enjoy those games anywhere near as much. And I think that many other people have the same kind of ideas. And honestly, I think it all comes down to one thing. What was the first memory you ever had of Total War, experiencing it, whether it be looking at screenshots, gameplay footage, or anything like that? Well, I'm going to take a wild stab in the dark here and make an assumption that it was of a big melee battle. And if you saw a video, maybe you saw the one with the elephant charging into the pack of soldiers and the soldiers just being tossed around all over the place in Rome Total War. Am I getting close here? I hope so, because that to me is what Total War is all about. That's what Total War did really, really well. Same with cavalry charges as well. If you charge into the side of a weak group of infantry units, I expect some of them to go flying as the impact of the charge comes in. I expect to see that line collapse, the panic setting in. That's all very cool stuff, but it requires melee. If you don't have melee, then you can't have that kind of cool stuff going on. Empire tried to keep some of this. I mean, cavalry wasn't useless by any stretch of the imagination within the Empire Total War period, but it was nowhere near as good. You didn't have that wedge lance charge going on. Cavalry were somewhat reduced to more of a scouting and harassing force as opposed to these big armored shock troopers. Gotta say though, the problem with Total War development is that we're kind of running out of cool time periods. I think I would like to see one that was focused on ancient Greece and the surrounding civilizations there. I think that would work pretty well, but admittedly, in Rome Total War, you already have the Carthaginians you already have the Greek cities, would there really be a large enough division? Could you go far enough back in order to make that work with Greece? And then, do you make the decision to go just a little bit mythological with that? Do you actually go down the city-building game Zeus or Age of Mythologies kind of route, where you throw the mythology in there and you put some magical or godlike kinds of units into the game, maybe some crazy creatures? I could see that happening with a Total War game at some point, and I would have a lot of fun with that, I feel. But after that, where do you go? Some people suggest World War One. That is a really terrible idea. World War One combat is incredibly dull. The fact is, with trench warfare involved in it and the inability to properly break those trenches, unless you put a lot of emphasis on maybe late era World War One with tanks, or at least what there were tank-wise, which was very little and most of them broke down anyway, then I have to wonder if you get any enjoyment out of that whatsoever. I'm probably going to go with no. Plus, honestly, that time period sucks. It really, really does. You can't go far enough through in time in order to really make that work. If you go too far, then you end up in World War II, and then you have this whole technological arms race thing going on, which actually is not what the Total War games have ever really been about. You might get a slight edge in terms of your technology, but most of the time, you really don't, and most of the units tend to match up pretty well against each other. It comes down to size, placement, and tactics. 
Now, one other thing I want to say about all of this Total War nonsense is that I don't know if I really trust Creative Assembly. I have stopped listening to what they have to say prior to their release a long time ago. The reason being that they have released time after time games that have started off being very buggy and don't contain the features or indeed the improvements that they promised. That is a little concerning to me to say the least. I think that Shogun and especially Fall of the Samurai were much better in this regard, so he is hoping there's a bit of a turnaround there. But I also don't like the fact that they have precluded modding. That was a big thing for Rome and a big thing for Medieval 2, and since we haven't seen it since, well, the games have got just a little bit weaker in my honest opinion. We will see, but once again with Creative Assembly, while they do make great games, they're often heavily flawed and you need to be extremely careful, especially when buying on launch because they're often plagued with AI and performance problems. Next email comes in from Plunk that says, Currently on the Planetide Universe forums, there's a sizable thread discussing the KD stats, kill death, displayed on almost every menu of the game. Some say it'll promote a more selfish style of play and deter pure support roles, while others say it's necessary to bring in the Call of Duty demographic and that more stats are always better. You can make the argument that if you don't like the stats, you can just ignore them, but you can't ignore the overall impact it might have on the gameplay as a whole. I also find myself very much affected by KDR despite knowing better and will probably spend much more time in tanks and fighters than I would otherwise as opposed to transporting people in a galaxy or trying to get objectives on foot. The simple removal of death stats would have a dramatic effect on my playstyle fun and willingness to experiment with new strategies. What is your view on persistent death stats in team oriented games and do you think it's worth sacrificing a complete and total display of stats for the sake of gameplay? Well I think you can have a happy medium honestly. The problem that you've got with games like this is how do you incentivize people to the point where they're kind of doing the right thing without really knowing it? Most people that come into a game are going to do really dumb things, especially when it comes down to a game like Planetide. Planetide is deceptively simple. It appears like it's just a straight up shooter, but in reality, there's a hell of a lot of depth below what's going on there, especially when you start to look at the way the territory control works and how you can best logistically support your empire and get them to where they need to be. So more often than not, you have to kind of encourage players that are not so tactically minded in order to get them to the right place. So you do so with incentives. Tribes does this. It doesn't necessarily do it all that well, but it gives you incentives for doing certain things. Like you get more in-game points for doing a gotta go fast grab than you would for doing a normal grab. In fact, you don't really get many points for that at all. But then of course you also get points for returning the flag which isn't necessarily a good idea because sometimes you want the flag to be in an awkward spot so it's difficult to get a usual high-speed grab route going on it. So it kind of sends mixed messages. The game sometimes encourages you to do the right thing and sometimes encourages you to do very much the wrong thing. I would say that you can have KD in a game like Planetside. The original Planetside actually had KD, but what it didn't do was actually prominently display it. You had to turn your KD on, if I recall correctly. It was either a slash command to show KD, or it was a slash command that allowed you to flash up your KD for a little while and then it would disappear again. Whatever the case, I don't think denying people that information is a very good thing. I think that when you arm players with stats and facts, they can better express themselves through gameplay and they can better learn how to improve themselves. That said, I don't think it should be a constant reminder because I think if it is, then you are encouraged to take on behavior which is not necessarily conducive to a proper team game. You will not be encouraged necessarily to fly a galaxy. You want fat KD, ergo you might end up being in an aircraft, which is where you might get the most. There were a lot of people who actually hoard KD in Planetside 1 and they were some of the most obnoxious people in the entire game. That's not the kind of behavior I would like to encourage. If all you do is sit in a reaver all day and pick off guys on the ground, then that doesn't really make you all that useful. Killing people in planet side is actually not the way to win, as surprising as it sounds. Like, what? It's a first person shooter? No, it's actually a logistical game. It's about making sure that you have the most spawn points near to a territory and actually take that territory. How many guys you shoot really doesn't make much of a difference when they can respawn and there are already thousands of them. It is a never ending tide. What you must do is cut off their spawn points, cut off their reinforcements and prevent them from logistically being able to take an area or defend it with any degree of effectiveness. That is what Planet Side is all about. KD is irrelevant. If I go 0-20, and yet I go 0-20 because I flew 20 galaxies in and got them deployed in good positions, then I am credit to team. I am not credit to team if I ran around killing a bunch of people, because again, who cares about the kills in a game where you've got thousands of people infinitely respawning until the end of bloody time? 
That said, I think that it should be available on the stats screen. I think, in fact, it should be available via a very advanced statistical system. And I think that they can do that. It looks like they can. They've got what they require in order to make that work. There is a very advanced online website, as well as an API, which is going to feed data to various apps. And of course, their own official app. So I would think that they'll be able to break it down by a day by day, weapon by weapon basis and all that good stuff. So that's fine. But I definitely hope that they don't encourage that. I think that they should remove the stats from anywhere else other than a dedicated stats page that you actually have to go into and interrupt your combat in order to see. They would be making a grave error, I feel, if they put too much emphasis on KD. If I'm playing Team Deathmatch, on the other hand, then yes, KD is actually kind of important. So don't be surprised if I flash the screen up every now and again in the background. This email comes in here from Alexander that says, I was just wondering where all the hate between gamers has come from. I have been primarily a console gamer since the declining days of the SNES and the rise of the N64, but always loved games as a medium. Thus, I have never understood the hate between gamers dedicated to a specific system or franchise, especially in the recent years when PC gaming proved to have superior qualities, if you had the hardware for it, that is. Most PC gamers seem to have taken to treat console gamers with disdain and mocked them on the internet. So far as I can tell, this can cause problems for devs of console games down the line. I just wanted to know if you had any insight on the problem. Well, this goes back a very, very long time. There was a particular rivalry. I would say probably if you go all the way back to the Nintendo Entertainment System versus the Sega Master System, they were set against each other, and Sega versus Nintendo was a big deal until Sony came along. There were a couple of generations, at least, of consoles, as well as, of course, the battle between the Game Boy and the Game Gear. We all know how that went. That had this very aggressive marketing stance Sega does what Nintendo don't. So much aggressive marketing. I think it was mostly from Sega's side, honestly. Nintendo seemed to be less fussed, but Sega did a lot of negative advertising saying, hey, the NES isn't anywhere near as good as the Master System, and the SNES is nowhere near as good as the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis, blah, blah, blah. They even did comparisons with the color screen of Game Gear, to Game Boy. And at that time in the console wars, it was in their best interest to keep this animosity going. Not only that, but most households could only afford one. So what happens when you can only afford one of two, maybe even three competing products? Well, you of course believe that your decision was the correct one because of course you would not buy an inferior product. That would make you an idiot. You're the guy that bought the best one, right? Yeah, of course, absolutely. Naturally, you bought the best machine. So as a result, you look on everyone else with disdain and you kind of circle the wagons around your choice. This can lead to all manner of interesting things, including a form of buyer's remorse, where people lash out as a result of owning one particular system. It comes down to things like jealousy and a little bit of cognitive dissonance. They know that their system might not have been the best choice, they know they really want this other system, but since they can't have it, they need to condemn it and convince themselves that in fact they made the correct decision and they are the guys that have the superior system. When it comes down to PC gamers hating console gamers, it goes a little bit deeper than that. I mean, there's the whole PC gaming master race nonsense that is a phrase that's actually designed to mock people that believe that, but for some inexplicable reason, some people take it seriously, but hey, internet. I think it comes down to the fact that PC gamers spent a lot of money on their machine, and yet they see two things happening. One, they see a particular generation of games designed for consoles coming out on consoles first with specific game mechanics and arguably quite a lot of dumbing down. They then see these games ported to the PC later and more often than not worse in a way that doesn't actually properly utilize the hardware. I think if you've watched my WTF is a prototype 2, you'll probably understand this attitude. We waited a couple of months for prototype 2, and the game doesn't look any better than it did on consoles, and it doesn't even run very well. On a 680, it's struggling around 30 to 44 FPS, with options turned down to low, which is actually insanity, especially when the texture work in the game looks like absolute ass. So who do people lash out at? Well, when you think about it, if people were smart, they'd all own PCs, consoles wouldn't be around, and we would have our glorious PC gaming master race, and the golden gods of Machina would descend from high and provide us with a proper sequel to Duke Nukem. So there's actually a little bit of twisted logic there. Yes, if all of those circumstances were to occur, then the hate towards console gamers is supposedly justified. But if you think you're going to convert people to PC by acting like pompous elitist jerks, then you've got another thing coming. It simply will not work because the console gamers have a similar attitude. They will circle the wagons around their purchases. And then, of course, we will have this 
big, horrendous standoff that we currently have and have had for the longest time. And trust me, there will be deliberate incitement of animosity because fanboyism and console warring, that is beneficial to the console manufacturers. They want that to happen. It keeps it fresh in the mind. It gives them a legion of evangelists for free. Not even for free. These guys actually pay money for the privilege of evangelizing a product. Wow, what a great system we have in place here. I guess that's where most of the hatred comes from. Of course, it goes way deeper than that. You've got people that hate others for certain games and certain genres, like LOL vs. Hon, but, well, I don't want a 45-minute mailbox, so I'm not going to go into that. Okay, folks, that is me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the mailbox. Please bear in mind that I am heading off to San Francisco, and I will not be back until next Tuesday. There are a few WTF videos that are sitting in reserve that you'll be able to watch, and they will pop up over the next couple of days. And I will be bringing you End of Nations content, myself versus Epic Mealtime in the Food Fight event. That's guaranteed to be interesting. As well as War of the Roses charity tournament, and some footage from Natural Selection 2. I'll see you next time.